thank you everybody for turning up and, and tuning in to listen to the meeting um, on such a sunny evening. Um, what I thought we'd talk about over the next kind of 30 or 40 minutes is to think about um, building ground models for um, site survey, marine site survey, um, uh, challenge, uh, marine site survey problems. Uh, and in particular, think about how we move from uh, a more traditional ground model towards a quantitative ground model. So what I'll start with is just a, a kind of set a bit of a kind of groundwork just so that we know where we're all coming from. And so I'll start by introducing what I think of as a ground model and then in particular what I think of as a quantitative ground model. And then moving on from there, I'll then look at, at, at ways in which we can basically try and leverage more information from in particular the geophysical data so that we can then make a, a better quality ground model and move towards this concept of a, of a quantitative ground model. So um, ground model is, is defined as being a 3D representation of the seafloor and the subsea floor conditions. Um, and it, it combines together a, a huge array of different data sources. I mean, typically people very often think of it as, com as including just geological, geotechnical and geophysical data. But actually a good ground model will also include marine archaeological data, uh, oceanographic data, um, uh, met-ocean data, and ecological data. There's a whole raft of other stuff that feeds into the ground model. Um, so there's a, a huge wealth of information there. Um, and they are used and applied for all manner of different offshore projects. So the scale and the scope of ground models can be hugely broad. If you think about it in terms of the questions that you're trying to answer, the types of questions you're trying to answer for, a, a, say, a, a cable or pipeline uh, installation site survey are completely different from the kinds of questions you're asking for a, a, a drilling top hole study or a, or a wind farm installation. So the types of areas that are being covered, the depth of penetration and the scale of, of structure that we're interested in can vary hugely between different projects. Despite that variability, very often ground models have quite a lot in common. And generally speaking, what they, they tend to involve doing is, is building this picture of a series of soil provinces, which kind of simplify the subsurface up into uh, a range of geological units that can then be characterized in different ways. Now, by doing that, you build up a 3D picture of the subsurface. But if you build a ground model in that more kind of traditional way, what you tend to end up building is a, a ground model that is structurally 3D, but actually only contains isolated quantitative information. So if you look at the image on the top right here, the, the um, surfaces that you see here, the yellow, the purple and the orange surface are the structural horizons which have come from the geophysical data. The quantitative information we have about the actual subsurface conditions, though, really only comes from these 1D isolated points, so the vertical grey uh, cylinders plotted through there. Um, the only way to really start moving towards a quantitative ground model is if we are then to try and integrate all of those different data sets together so that we actually move into a realm where we have a 3D ground model that is both structurally 3D and also characterizes the soil conditions in 3D as well. Uh, and in order to do that, we need to try and maximize, in particular, the sorts of information we can get from the geophysical data. You know, Boreholes and CPTs tell us huge amounts of really high fidelity information about the soil conditions, but they will always be a fundamental limit as to how many holes we can put in the ground. The seismic data and the, the geophysical data offers us the opportunity to get that coherent 2D or 3D picture, albeit at lower resolution or with more kind of limited properties. So the question really is how can we knit those together in order to move towards this kind of ideal that is a quantitative ground model. So a model, a ground model that has both 3D structural and 3D um, soil conditions information. In reality, what a lot of the things that, that we're doing as geophysicists when we're interpreting our seismic data and when we're 
um, trying to characterize it and look at these kind of quantitative properties. In reality, a lot of the things we're doing there are very similar and we're thinking about the subsurface in very similar ways to what geologists and geotechnical engineers do already do. The problem is there is this language barrier between the sorts of words and terms that we use as geophysicists and the sorts of words and terms that geologists and geotechnical engineers use to describe very similar related processes. So I think one of the key things that we I'll kind of talk about as we're going through this and that kind of underpins a lot of the work that I will I will show over the next half an hour is about trying to break down that language barrier and be able to communicate the sorts of things that we see and that we are comfortable with as geophysicists to how to communicate them across so that they can then be used effectively by geologists or engineers so how um, they can understand then what they're actually dealing with. So in order to, to kind of look at that and look at how we can best communicate that information, I've kind of posed three questions that I'll talk about and, as we work through the uh, presentation. And they start off relatively simple and they get a bit more complicated as we go along. So the first question really is about um, communicating just the architecture that we see on a seismic reflection uh, data set. So are we effectively communicating all of the subtle structure, all of the little details that seismic interpreters see on the data? Are we really making sure that we, we communicate that through into the later project phases so that all of that information gets used? The second question then is, is well, moving on from that and moving into trying to be actually be a bit more quantitative. So rather than just describing architecture, let's actually derive some of the, the, the soil conditions. The second question then is, are we making maximum use of the, the products, of the, the information that we already derive? So things like velocity or key factor that we derive from processing, are we making the most of, of those? Or can we do more with those in order to be able to move forward and help characterize the subsurface. And then the third question, which I suppose is probably the million dollar question that lots of people have kind of asked, and, and there's been lots of talk about uh, going back 20, 30 years now, is, um, is it feasible to derive geotechnical information from geophysical data? And if so, how might we do that? So we'll, we'll come on to that at the end. I just want to start though really simply. So let's kind of warm up with some, uh, something a little bit, a little bit easier to get our teeth into. And really, that's just thinking about making sure we make the most of all of the information that we have in front of us. Now, classically, when we're interpreting the seismic reflection data and feeding it into a ground model, what we do is we take something like this really pretty seismic section you see on the left here and we would interpret a series of horizons on there that map major fascist boundaries and sometimes depending on how detail we're going going into sub fascist boundaries as well um, and then those interfaces get translated across as horizons mapping out the boundaries between different soil units or between different seismostratigraphic units that then you try and tie into the soil units from your CPT and your borehole. The problem with that is that there is a huge wealth of information on this section that the seismic interpreter uses when you're trying to define where are your fascist boundaries, where are your sub fascist boundaries, what are those, what are these reflections telling you about the nature of those units? Things like you know the the change in dip of the reflections and the stiff, the change in spacing of the reflections in this prograding unit uh, that I've kind of coloured yellow or the complex sub fasces in the, the really complicated erosional unit that's, that's shaded pale, pale green, or the change in vertical bedding in this um, sub-parallel layered unit at the bottom that's, that's shaded blue. You know, all of that subtle information that tells us about how the internal architecture of those fashions is varying spatially across our study area is potentially really useful. If you're wanting to, you know, think about how you might need to change your foundation design across an area, understanding things like how does the bedding in your prograding unit change laterally 
over a site is a really useful bit of information to have. And remember the differences we're seeing on this section, they're just across a 650 meter stretch of the subsurface. Some of the sites, particularly the offshore wind sites, will cover tens of kilometers. So there can be huge amounts of lateral variability within a fascist. Whereas if all we're doing is for essentially taking these boundaries and propagating them forward, it's a bit like all we're using is the seismic data shown on the right, of just the reflections for those major boundaries. So unless the engineers go back and actually look at the, at the seismic data itself, then loads of this information is going to get lost. And I think one of the really key, kind of, if you're thinking of a low hanging fruit that you could really look at and, and lever, leverage quickly and easily to help um, communicate information through, being able to capture this sort of spatial variability in the architecture is a really simple thing that we could do to improve. Now, there's a number of ways you could think about doing this. One of the key ways I think that's, again, is a relatively simple one is to use seismic attributes to be able to capture different features of those subsurface fashions. Now, the ones I think, are, there's, a, there's a whole raft of different seismic attributes. They've been used for a number of years now in the, the exploration industry. Um, the ones I think are some of the most useful are image analysis based attributes, um, which basically are, are designed to capture reflection architecture. And so you can look at the, there are, there's a whole raft of them you could use, but I think three of the most, at least the simplest to get your head around are ones which look at things like similarity or dissimilarity or energy. So looking at essentially how, how much reflections we're getting from that unit. And so by using those different attributes, you can then start to pull out different bits of information about the nature of the subsurface. And in particular, you can then map those attributes out. So you can, you can produce charts or maps which show visually that spatial variability in the structure. The other thing that these are really useful for is highlighting specific structural features that you know will be of interest to say the design engineers, but highlighting them such that the design engineers feel more comfortable interpreting a seismic reflection section. And I think that's, that's one of the key things that we need to remember as geophysicists is that we're used to looking at the seismic reflection data. So we know, you know, we're quite comfortable in drawing these colored lines on it. But a lot of, if you're not a seismic specialist, it can be very daunting working out, okay, well, where are the boundaries within there? And what in particular, in terms of the subtle features, are we actually looking at? So just to illustrate that, I want to show this, this example from a, a, a shallow gas um, project that we did quite a few years ago. Um, now I think it's particularly useful because for interpreting geohazards, I think is one area where using this sort of information could have um, a huge impact because interpreting geohazards on reflection data is technically very often very complicated. You have to interpret geohazards very, you know, most of the time you are looking at that lateral variability either at interfaces or between or, or within fasces. That's really the information that you're looking at to be able to characterize the geohazard. And particularly if you're thinking about something like shallow gas. And, and this is a, a really nice um, case study where we have, um, we were injecting gas down at the bottom of the section here and then monitoring as it, as it migrated up through the section. So you can see in here some really strong high amplitude reflections um, associated with this H2 horizon um, where you've got gas which has migrated and then has started to, to collect at that stratigraphic level. If you look in a little bit more detail, you can see evidence for shallow gas at the shallower subsurface, so around about this H1 stratigraphic horizon as well. If you look really in detail, you can start to see detailed um, deformation and little kind of amplitude anomalies between horizon one and the sea floor. And I guess the key point I want to kind of make here is that in reality, particularly with things like this, with, with shallow gas, the only people that can make an educated decision on whether that free gas there has any, what implications it has on say the design 
are the design engineers themselves. As geophysicists, we don't have the knowledge to make those decisions as to what free gas here, what it would impact on the design. So we need to be able to capture this information, and in this case, be able to capture the fact that there is free gas migrating up through this vertical chimney-like structure all the way up to the sea floor, capture it in a way that they can look at and understand what they're seeing. And so what we've done here is we've designed a uh, seismic attribute that, con that combines a number of different individual attributes together to pick out and highlight reflection architecture that's associated with these kind of diffuse, um, discontinuous reflections, classical of that kind of vertical gas migration pathways. And so it picks out really nicely that vertical migration route going right through horizon two, right through horizon one, and right up to the seafloor. Now, yes, it does pick out some other features away from that, but we have to remember this is chirp data, it's uh, surface toad, it's quite shallow water, so there are other noises in there, but it does a really nice job of highlighting the structural features that to geophysicists might be, might be um, obvious to us, but to the design engineers and the people that have to use this to make educated decisions might well not be. The key thing there though is that that's really good for communicating that architecture and for communicating our geophysical interpretations better. But what it's not really doing is getting at the quantitative information about, okay, so there is gas here, but how much gas is there there? So, that's where I think we come on to the second question I posed, which was thinking about, okay, moving towards more quantifying the subsurface conditions. And the easiest, and I suppose, the, again, lowest hanging fruit of kind of ways we can try and quantify the subsurface is to make better use of information that we already derive. So what kind of products do we derive from processing or from interpretation that we can then use to, to better quantify the subsurface? And I think there are two really key um, potential um, products that we can make use of here. The first one is one that um, I think is massively underused in the site survey industry. It's used quite widely for exploration scale stuff, but attenuation or Q factor, which is inversely, atten uh, inversely proportional to attenuation, is, is a, a property that is not very widely estimated from site survey data, um, but it is a incredibly useful one because Q factor shows a really, really um, strongly bipolar relationship to the soil behavior. So if you, if you had take a granular sediment, in a granular sediment, the pore space is highly connected. So when you compress a granular sediment, the pore fluid and the grain skeleton can move independently. So you compress it, effectively the pore fluid can move out of the way and the grain skeleton then can then uh, compress. As a result of that, you get lots more grain to grain contact, you get lots of energy loss through frictional heating, and etc. So you get a cluster of very low Q factors, so very high attenuation, for granular sediments, a ge what a geotechnical engineer would describe as being a material that behaves in a drained way. Conversely, if you have a cohesive material, um, when you compress that, because the pore spaces are not so well connected, the pore fluid can't get out of the way as easily. So you don't get that same level of grain to grain contact, you don't get the same level of frictional heating and energy loss. So you get this second kind of cluster of points here associated with um, cohesive sediments that have much higher Q factors, so much less attenuation. Now, you can you know, do other things with it, but, but as an absolute base level, one of the things that gives you is a clear way to distinguish between what are granular, sandy, gravelly layers and what are cohesive, silty clays. So if you have a stratigraphy that is interbedded silts, clays and sands, you can start to use Q factor then to pull apart what seismostratigraphic reflections correspond to which lithostratigraphic reflections. So you can then use the Q factor as a first order tie between your seismic data in time and your lithostratigraphic data in depth. So you can essentially use the Q factor to help build a fairly robust time to depth relationship. 
The second parameter, and I'll come back to Q in a minute as well, again, um, is, is velocity. Now, if I thought this kind of the, sub the subtitle for the talk was the, the good, the bad, and the ugly insight investigation. And I think, um, I think Q factor to a certain extent is a bit of the bad because we don't really, very often, I think we underuse it. The velocities, I think, to a certain extent, and some things can get pretty ugly. I've seen a, a number of projects over the, la over the years where, you know, quite often people have just taken 1600 meters a second for the subsurface and just then it's blanket, it's the subsurface, it's 1600 meters a second, that's absolutely fine. Or I've seen work where as people have essentially assigned a single velocity to each seismostratigraphic fashions, um, which neither of which really is representative of the subsurface um, and it misses out on a huge amount of useful information. This section here you can see we're even in a, a, a laterally relatively continuously bedded sequence we are still getting 50 100 meters a second sort of contrast and velocity over a 350 meter section um, and that sort of information is really useful in being able to tell us things about the how compacted the subsurface is. The P wave velocity or impedance which in, in these sorts of sediments is very very closely related to it are, um, are primarily sensitive to how compacted the sediment are and much less sensitive to, to the grain scale structure like to the lithology and so that's where I think like I said I'd come back to Q factor and it, if you can get a good velocity model and you can also then get a good Q factor model you can use those together to tell you quite a lot of information about the nature of the subsurface. So here we've got high velocities and very Q, low Qs in this top layer, which correspond very nicely to a, a, a highly uh, granular substrate, which in the, in, the core, in the core comes out as gravel or sandy gravel. So it ties really nicely. Underneath that, we've got lower velocities. So about 1700 to 1800 meters a second. So they're lower than the gravel, but still quite high. And they also have a high Q factor. So the high Q factor is indicating that they're fine grained, silty, clay sort of material, but the higher velocity is suggesting they're over consolidated, which again bears through with the core when they come out as being siltstone and mudstones. So again, that information together gives us a very good baseline for under getting a handle on what the lithology is, um, even at, at first principles before we, we poke any holes in the ground or when we only have a relatively few holes in the ground to work with. And we can kind of go a bit of a step further with that. So if we take here, so in, in the background of these two plots, these are kind of a classical geotechnical engineers plot. This is from uh, Robertson's 2010 paper, looking at the normalized um, soil behavior type um, based on CPT information. So um, here, the, each of these colored units here is a different soil behavior type. And I've kind of labeled them all along the bottom. Essentially, down in the bottom right here, you've got finer grain material. Up in the top left, you've got more granular material. And as you go to the bottom left or the top right, you're going either to much more sensitive material or to more kind of over consolidated material. So if the Q factor is behaving as we expect it, then these colored dots that I've plotted over the top, which are colored based on Q factor, they should show a trend for yellows and greens and blues to group in the bottom right and for oranges and reds to group up towards the top left. And that broadly speaking is what we see. Um, there's some scatter which is basically caused by the um, resolution at which we can derive Q factor, but broadly speaking there's a good relationship there between where everything from kind of like um, behaviour type 4, so silty mixtures down as high Qs, and from behaviour type 5, so sand mixtures up as a much lower Q. With impedance or velocity, where the two are, are behave in a very similar way with these sorts of sediments, they are, um, it's a bit more complicated. What we would, if it was purely controlled by compaction, we'd expect a kind of a, a bottom left to top right sort of trend. But because we have some level of, um, of lithological control, it's more complicated. And you tend to find that essentially your lower cues, so your oranges, and reds and some of your yellows tend to group near the bottom of the section and your um, more um, higher impedances so your yellows into greens and blues group towards the top. 
So it's, it's not clear cut because of the resolutions at which we can make the measurements, but there are trends there we can use. And if we flip the plot around and instead of plotting geophysical data on a geotechnical plot, we plot geotechnical data on a geophysical plot. Um, here I'm plotting the same data on Q factor versus impedance, but I'm coloring it by the soil behavior type. So the colors here correspond to the numbered colors on these plots and then will correspond to the groups at the bottom. And what you can see straight away is that we get these relatively nice clusters of sensitive material for high Q, low impedance, gravels for low Q, high impedance. And you, so by taking these two parameters which, that really ought to fall out of our processing, we can actually say quite a lot of information about grouping the sorts of litho lithologies in the subsurface. We can also go a little bit further than that. So I've got another case study just to illustrate, which I'll go through a bit quickly because time's running away a bit. But this is a coming back to that gas sequestration um, uh, case study that I used previously, but looking at it in a bit more detail. So one of the things we did here is not only did we inject CO2 into the subsurface and then survey over the top of it with, with uh, CHIRP to bottom profiler, we went back and we repeatedly monitored it. So we took a baseline data set before we injected and then we, we took multiple uh, data sets over the top of that as we were, um, as the gas was being injected and then migrating through the subsurface. So we have a reflection record that shows the, how the gas has migrated up through the subsurface has accumulated at these particular stratigraphic levels and then eventually managed to migrate its way up through to the sea floor. Now, as we kind of saw when we were looking at the earlier example, mapping gas um, where gas is accumulating in the subsurface is kind of is, is much is relatively easy. You can start to see the reflection amplitudes change with that. Mapping where it's migrating is, is harder and is more subtle. But we can, we can use those kind of processing parameters to get a handle on that. So if we map out Q factor and we take Q factor measurements between different stratigraphic levels, we can see significant changes in Q factor associated with where there's gas in the subsurface. So we essentially we can map out Q factor anomalies. The other thing we can do is we can map, we can look at the travel time between different stratigraphic levels and see how that has changed as the experiment has gone on. Um, as you get gas accumulating up within these different units, that will then change the velocity at which the wave field is propagated. So you get apparent travel time changes between say the sea floor and horizon one or between the sea floor and horizon two caused by gas presence in those shallow sediments. So by mapping those travel time changes, we can then back out the velocity change in the subsurface. And in this case, for this data from day 12 after injection, we've got a, a velocity, a peak velocity anomaly of about minus 300 meters a second. So we've got that quantitative information then that tells us about how much attenuation the gas is causing and how much it's slowing down the wave field propagation. A question that we could legitimately ask is, can we use that to get at a gas saturation estimate. So the way we did that uh, was work with a colleague of mine, Eugene Morgan, who's at Penn State. Um, and so he took um, reflectivity, velocity, and Q factor anomalies and used that to seed a rock physical model. We then optimized the rock physical model using a, a hierarchical Bayesian approach. So basically the way it worked is that we had some rough background information about broadly what the sediments were at in the certainly in the area so we took those as input and from that created um, um, a um, from that we created a uh, probability distribution an initial a priori probability distribution for the different parameters we then ran that optimization using the q factor um, and the velocity and the reflectivity for the um, pre-release data and based on that we then essentially derived a background geological rock physical model. We can then take the output from that and add into that a probability density for the um, uh, gas, for gas saturation, so a priori gas saturation estimate. Use this as the priori information and then run the Bayesian optimization again to account for the Q factor anomalies and the velocity anomalies caused by the gas. 
And then falling out of that, then we get a gas saturation estimate for the subsurface. And our being Bayesian, we get a distribution from that. Now, the really neat thing is, so we've got an estimate for gas saturation and, and gas saturation is one of those things that there are ways you can get an estimate from, but actually testing it to make sure it's a sensible number is a bit harder. Um, but here, there were some estimates to look at in terms of how much volume of gas was thought to be left in the still in the subsurface because we were injecting the gas in, so we knew how much had gone in, and we were using observational and geochemical um, uh, monitoring to try and track how much of it had come out at the sea floor. So by using that information, we get the red line here, and in the background, the, the histogram and, the, and the, the, the black lines and dashed lines are our predicted gas saturation volumes based on those phase and inversions. So I think that's a pretty decent agreement, um, even using relatively simple parameters, uh, just to get an estimate for gas saturation. So that's, that's, you know, that's quite a nice result. I guess moving on and the, and, and the more complicated questions though, um, you know, gas saturation and, and, and that sort of thing, and, and being able to get a, a handle on lithology using Q and velocity are, are useful parameters to be able to do. But in reality, for the majority of ground models, what we're really wanting to do is to use that to inform some engineering design. So if we want that information, if we want to be able to maximize that, then we need to start thinking about trying to get geotechnical properties out of it. So how might we try and do that? And um, can we do that? Um, now, it seems a really daft thing to say, but um, geotechnical characterization is difficult. Um, and one of the things that makes it so tricky is because the, the kind of parameters that we need to derive. If we're going to do this in a useful way, what we need to be able to do are, are derive some parameters that characterize, that are, are directly useful in the engineering design phase. So we're thinking about then things like rendering shear strength, relative density, friction ratio, um, uh, pore pressure, uh, small strain shear strength, um, void ratio, those sorts of those sorts of parameters which can be used for designing um, our our infrastructure. If we want to be able to get at those, then obviously we can't, I don't think, realistically think about getting at those using seismic attributes or just relying on properties that we can derive from the processing, like the velocity and the Q factor, because we just can't get that high fidelity detailed information that we need from those routes. And we have to look at using seismic inversion to do this. However, it's a big however, is we can't cast seismic inversion directly in terms of those properties because to get a robust seismic inversion, we need really to cast the seismic inversion in terms of parameters that are closely linked and relatively straightforwardly linked with how the seismic wave field propagates. You know, there's been a lot of work on the exploration industry scale trying to look at and cast it in terms of rock physical properties to be able to directly get at reservoir parameters. And there's been some work that's been successful at that, but it's still very, very hard to do. Um, these parameters here are very, are related to the seismic wave field propagation in a very complicated way. There's lots of cross, from a, at least from a seismic wave field viewpoint, there's lots of crosstalk between these parameters. There's lots of sensitivity variabilities, which make casting an inversion in terms of these parameters extremely difficult. So in reality, the, the, certainly the way we've had success in trying to do this is to do it in two stages. So you cast the seismic, you take the seismic inversion approach uh, using a more traditional method, which gets you at something, say, you know, this is single channel boomer data, so it might get you at impedance. If you've got multi-channel data, you think about doing it in AVO way, or you can try and do full waveform inversion and get at a full elastic characterization. And we've got, and we've certainly gone and done that and got some good results from that. And then you step on from there into your geotechnical characterization um, and um, and the parameters that you actually really want. So the questions really I'm gonna talk about for the rest of the talk for the next kind of 10 minutes or so is how do we go from these sorts of geophysical parameters that we can relatively easily get to 
and go to these sorts of geotechnical parameters which we want but are much harder to get to. Now one, uh, one route which I think has shown great promise in trying to do this is to use machine learning uh, and the reason I think machine learning is, uh, shows particular promise is because the, the relationship between the geophysical properties and the geotechnical properties, in particular the compression away properties, which are the ones we can most easily get to, are complex and they're non-linear and they vary between different sites and they vary between different fascias at the same site because they depend because the geotechnical properties depend so much on not only how a sediment was deposited, how a soil was deposited, but also what's happened to it afterwards. And they depend on that in a way that, that ge the geophysical properties don't, certainly not to the same level of um, sensitivity. And I, I just want to show and illustrate this with these two examples here. So on the left is uh, some data from Finnafjord, which is a fjord in mid Norway. It's a relatively, at least the part of the section we're looking at there is relatively straightforward. It's just Holocene deposition. Uh, um, fluvial material washed down into the fjord. So it's essentially characterized as one single stratigraphic unit. Um, if you cross plot impedance and tip resistance there, you get a fairly sensible kind of linear relationship. You could stick a line through it, then you could try and predict tip resistance based on the impedance and you'd get sensible results. The problem with these sorts of data is that this site, you don't need a geophysicist to do this because a geotechnical engineer could do this in their sleep with their arms tied behind their back. They don't need us to tell them the tip resistance at these sorts of sites. The sorts of sites they really need, um, there's the sorts of sites that they really need that information from are the more complicated ones. So the, the one on the, the site on the right is a, um, is, is the Walney wind farm site in uh, Eastern Irish Sea. Now that's a much more complicated site, it's been previously glaciated multiple times. So you've got lots of erosion, lots of depositions, glacial loading, all sorts of stuff going on. In there, I kind of characterize it in terms of, I think five uh, seismic fascias above the bedrock. Um, if you cross plot impedance against tip resistance there and color those points based on seismic fascias, you can see that there is no linear relationship there of any use at all. Um, there is just simply too much difference in the relationship between the different fashions. So the way machine learning can be really useful in that is it can capture those sorts of non-linear relationships, but we can also, we can throw at it all the information that we have. So we can throw at it impedance, we can throw at it some seismic attribute information, we can throw at it Q, we can throw at it all sorts of different bits of information that we get handle on and it can sift through it and look for the relationships in a way that you can't do it using a, a traditional uh, kind of regression approach. If you do that, and in this case I'm using a neural network, an artificial neural network to do it, you can get a much better fit between the predicted tip resistance and the measured tip resistance and, and that captures that fascist to fascist relationship. So here you're looking at the uh, those points are nicely following the one-one relationship, so it appears to be doing a pretty decent job. And if we compare that against the kind of traditional uh, methods for trying to map out quantitative, uh, our quantitative soil conditions through ground models, are uh, here on this is work that was done with colleagues at NGI, Martin Van Est and Carl uh, uh, Frederick Forsberg. Uh, and, and colleagues. So on the, on the left is a kind of a traditional approach where you're trying to take kind of tr general average trends from CPTs and uh, kind of trends of property envelopes and, and interpolate those across. In the middle is a slightly more complicated kind of co-creaging approach which is, is trying to be a little bit more um, mathematical about it. And then on the right is the machine learning and I think it's fairly obvious that the machine learning is doing a better job of catching that relationship. So I've just got one quick example of this being used in, in, in anger and then I'll, I'll wrap up and we can take some questions. So this is a, a commercial project uh, that we did a couple of years ago to de-risk some infrastructure maintenance uh, and the requirement here was to get very high resolution imaging so that we could identify and map the um, uh, soil conditions of some weak, weaker clay rich layers. Um, what they want, what the client wanted to do was to bring in a jacket rig um, uh, to, to construct the maintenance on the, on the infrastructure. 
Um, the jacket rig they wanted to bring in was a smaller one with a smaller spud can size. So it had a higher loading on the sea floor and they were concerned that it, they would get punched through with these weak clay rich layers. Now they had a whole bunch of ground truth data available that we could that, to use, but there was such variability at the site, they were a bit concerned about just trying to interpolate those ground truth sites into the areas they were interested in. So what we did is we took some hall mounted pinger data I'll say that again, it was whole mounted pinger data, this wasn't multi-channel UHRS data, um, and we inverted that and we derived uh, synthetic CPTs at the location, specific locations of interest. So we did it at the spud can locations for their jackup rig, where they wanted to position it both adjacent to the infrastructure for the maintenance, but also at their standoff location. So we could de-risk, or we could give them the information to be able to de-risk the whole kind of process. Um, obviously, whole amount of pinger data. One of the key thing, one of the key problems there is you've got no information to get your velocity data from. So for this, getting the Q factor was really critical because it enabled us to tie in the contrasts between the more cohesive and the more granular layers in the subsurface, and be able to um, and be able to then build a really good time to depth relationship between our lithostratigraphy and our seismostratigraphy. So from that we were confident that we were interpreting the right, um, um, that we were interpreting the right seismostratigraphic fasces as the weaker clay rich layers. We were also um, confident that we were able to then map out the thickness variability of those layers quite, quite well. Obviously, I'll kind of get through this side quite quickly because I know time's getting on. So, so one of the things we do when we, we apply the machine learning is you, are, you have to test it to make sure it's running and it's producing sensible results. So here we are training the data at some of the extant locations and testing it at other control sites. So these are blind predictions whereby the black line is the best fit and the shaded gray line is kind of the confidence interval. Uh, and so the, the neural network when it's trained to predict these, it has never seen the data from this site. It's only seen data from the other sites. So we're here, we're getting a, a pretty good fit here. Certainly in the cohesive layers, it matches those really nicely. In the complex sand layer, it matches it some places better than others, but that is quite a heterogeneous, spatially variable sand layer. So I don't think we necessarily expected to get all of the fine scale detail in those. What we were able to do then when we trained it on all of the data was generate a synthetic CPT at all the sites they were interested in from which we could then derive undrained shear strength and relative density kind of as per normal so we could then characterize the soil conditions. I think what was particularly useful for the clients in this case and has been so for other clients as well is that because we cast both our inversion and these sorts of geotechnical property predictions in terms of in terms of a stochastic sense, we don't just look for a single value that is the best estimate at that location. What we're actually trying to get is a parameter envelope. So what we were able to give them was a probability distribution of the likely uh, undrained shear strengths for those weaker clay rich layers. Uh, and they could then feed that in to their, um, their modeling and de-risk it. And I think the baseline is they were able to use the jacket rig that they wanted. They were able to bring it in safely, do the work they wanted and get out safely. And I think I'm right in saying that between using the smaller and cheaper jacket rig and without having to poke extra holes in the ground, so using the seismic kind of inversion to do the ground characterization, project saving on even such a small project as this was somewhere in the region of about 10 million US dollars. So a pretty significant saving. Um, all round. The one thing though I want to kind of caveat this with which is, I think is a uh, and it's a point that I think is a really important one is we all we do have to bear in mind the quality of the data that you're feeding into it so machine learning is not some kind of magical golden bullet that can solve everything and it is completely reliant on the quality of the data you give it so both the quality of the geotechnical data the but also the quality of the geophysical data and in particular the resolution of the geophysical data. So here I'm comparing three different data sets. On the left is the whole mounted soil bottom profiler data we've kind of just been talking about. So that's much higher resolution data um, looking at you know 
it's higher kill is more than a kilohertz. So in reality, it's looking at kind of centimetric to decimetric structure. The boomer in the middle is about 400 hertz to three or four kilohertz. So it's looking at decimetric to meter scale structure. And on the right is Sparker data. Now Sparker is a bit of a, there's, there's lots of different varieties of Sparker out there, but typically Sparker data sets are, and this one was, was um, less than two kilohertz. Now, the key things I think to look at here is that as you go from the high frequency data to the low frequency data, what you see is that you lose the ability to predict the high frequency structure in that CPT tip resistance profile. And that basically is down to the loss of the high frequency. So I'm plotting on the right here is cross plot of the measured against the predicted tip resistance. And you can see the machine learning is doing a good job of getting the general trend but there's a lot of scatter about that, which is basically caused by not capturing all that high frequency structure. If we look at the power spectral density functions for the uh, CPT data in black and for the uh, seismic data in gray, what you can see the problem really basically is that the seismic data doesn't have the high frequencies to capture. So it's just not sensitive to that high frequency structure. So whether predicting a synthetic CPT at for these sorts of data, for certainly when you're getting to low frequency data, is what you want and is the best solution for that particular project is, a, is an interesting question. And some of the things that we've been doing to try and get around that and still get really useful geotechnical parameters from, geophys from lower frequency geophysical data have been, we've been looking at trying to simplify the problem a bit. So rather than trying to cast it in terms of a regression, which is a more complicated problem to solve. Instead, we've tried to treat it as a classification problem where you have only a fixed number of potential outcomes. Um, and so it, it's easier and it, you can get a more stable prediction out of it. And so one of the things that we've done that's worked really quite well is to essentially cast it in a way that's trying to classify the subsurface in terms of your undrained shear strength or your relative density soil types. So, you know, very soft, soft, um, stiff, very stiff soils or very loose, dense, very dense kind of soils. And so here what we're plotting is, so again, it's that, that Sparker data that we were looking at on the previous slide. And here we're looking at a heat map with uh, the probability of that particular soil type being, um, the, being the soil type at that depth, at that location, um, with blues being low probability, reds being high probability. And over the top, I'm plotting in white the prediction from the CPT. Now, if you compare, you know, that sort of prediction we're getting from trying to do a synthetic CPT versus this sort of classification approach, in the classification approach, we're certainly, I think, getting a much more robust, um, more stable prediction. There are outliers, there's some areas where it's getting some slightly anomalous results, but it's doing a pretty decent job overall uh, for the vast majority of that data. So, just to summarise before, and then we'll go and we'll tackle some of the questions. Is we I've looked at in a kind of a bit of a whistle stop tour um, a number of different ways in which I think we can we can make site investigation um, more or certainly make the geophysical data and better integrate it in with the geological and geotechnical data to try and help move us to more towards those sort of, those sort of kind of quantitative ground models. And I think the three key take home messages I say from this, the three key summaries I say is that the effective integration doesn't just have to be in terms of fancy inversion techniques. There's an awful lot I think we can do just from better communication of our interpretation. And I think there's a lot of information there that gets lost needlessly between the seismic interpreter who does a great job and the um, design engineer who, you know, we need to make sure we get that all that detailed information and pass it on in a way that is, is, more, is useful and is understandable. I also think that there's you know, more information we can just leverage from our processing uh, products without necessarily having to go, you know, we can go a long way with that sort of information if we think about the questions in the right way and we understand and we think carefully about what it is we're trying to characterize. And then finally, you know, if we do want to throw inversions at it and we want to throw machine learning at it and we really want to try and get at geotechnical properties it's challenging there's no there's no beating about that bush 
but I do think it's certainly possible as long as you think about it carefully and objectively and you get a, a good understanding of, of what it is you're trying to trying to get at. Um, and I think though if there's one overhanging uh, kind of one overarching point I would like to finish up on making though is that the is that kind of feeling from those they say is that when it comes to building a quantitative ground model I really do think that the you know if I've learned one thing from the last few years of trying to do this it's that the best results come if you don't try and think of it as a turnkey solution you can take one approach which worked at like an absolute charm at one site and try and replicate it to another but because the data is slightly different because the geology is slightly different you don't get the same results and what you need to do is you need to be flexible and think about it as a, a toolbox of tools that you can use and uh, use them in, in a way that's appropriate for that specific project that's tackling the question specific for that project uh, in an appropriate way um, and in a way that addresses that that is appropriate for the geology and for the data that you have to hand so um, on that note I'll finish um, Artem shall we take some questions uh, thank you very much Mark for a very interesting results and quite impressive data sets and um, uh, sections you showed. Yes, we have a bunch of questions. Um, if you click on the Q&A uh, box in the, in the bottom of the screen, you can see them. And if you don't mind to reading them and answer one by one, if you like them. I'll go, I'll go through if I skip back. So the first question is about slide 12. So the question is, uh, confused by slide, uh, I, I may have misread it, but I'm a bit confused by your slide 12. It appears to indicate that grain size is higher for clay right hand side than sand left hand side. Um, that's because I'm plotting the mean grain size in terms of phi, not in terms of the grain sizes uh, uh, in micrometers. So higher phi is a smaller grain size. Um, so the next question is, uh, so, so the next question is about the gas injection case study. Uh, so if I skip forward to that slide, uh, we go to that one. So is how did you physically inject the gas into the subsurface and did you have borehole core control on the sediments and ledger technical parameters prior? Um, so the, the physical injection was done, so this is a shallow water site in near Oban, literally just over the other side of the, the lock from Oban um, in, in Western Scotland. Um, so this was a, a, a big project. This is the Quicks project that was had a whole raft of people involved in. Um, the, um, the, so the injection was done by drilling essentially a borehole down through a uh, directional drilling from on land out underneath the, um, so it, through the bedrock and then kind of popping out through, we, so we targeted an area where we thought the glacial tills were thinnest so we could try and pop out into the sediments uh, straight into the sediments and have kind of minimum leakage of gas into the glacial tills. So I guess the kind of the direction of drilling probably comes up somewhere like this and then pops out out into here where the red circle is. In terms of the borehole control, we so we didn't get any CPTs, so we have very limited geotechnical information. We had some cores from nearby, but nearby is 700 meters away because one of the things we were uh, we were slightly concerned about was altering the sediments too much in the in the vicinity of where the gas was being injected. What we didn't want to do was create a pathway for the gas to kind of migrate out um, that wasn't um, natural, if that makes sense. Um, so the next question is, can we consider shear wave velocity from acoustic impedance to predict geotechnical parameters? Um, no, is the short answer. Um, so um, shear waves and compressional wave. Well, my feeling is you have to teach us two very different measures. My skip, sorry, right to the end. So we've done some work uh, on looking at full waveform inversion. So um, we've. Uh, used multi-channel streamer data and if you're interested in that you know look at these papers by an old PhD student of mine Giuseppe Provenzano um, so he used full waveform inversion cast in a fully elastic sense to get at both 
compressional and shear wave properties of the subsurface. The complexity obviously from that though is that just because you get shear wave doesn't get the shear wave velocity doesn't get you straight into the geotechnical parameters you want. You can get to G max but you have to remember that we're looking at small strain measurements here whereas things like undrained shear strength are large strain measurements and so they're they're very different measurements so just getting to shear wave does not mean that you magically can get straight into all of these parameters here you can certainly get to g max Is there a reliable relationship between bulk, soil bulk density and P-wave velocity where uh, you estimate them from impedance? Um, the, there are some relationships between, uh, I don't have a slide, sorry. I would, uh, if you look at, um, I can provide, a t um, I don't know if you've got a method for doing it, Artem, I can provide some papers which might be relevant to the talk, um, which people can download if there's a way to put those up to share? Uh, yeah, we definitely can put some links uh, on our LinkedIn page uh, accompanying this talk, uh, as uh, well as the recording of this talk, yeah. Yeah, that, that would be fine. So there, there's some, um, so I, in one of an early, so a paper I did in 2015, I built on some existing works. So there's a whole raft of work done out of the Office of Naval Research in the US that was looking at relationship between these sorts of bulk parameters. So things like, uh, impedance, P-wave velocity, bulk density, porosity. Um, and there are some global relationships you can use there. Um, you have to caveat them. Um, they're not perfect. But I think if you're trying to pre predict parameter envelopes, I think they're valid to use. I think if you're using them to try and predict single values, then you need to be very care cautious about those global relationships. Um, Next question, uh, oh no, not that one, that one. Um, do you predict, do you calculate Q factor from instantaneous frequency? The short answer is no. I don't think instantaneous frequency is a particularly robust way of doing it. So there's a number of good ways to do it. Um, you use spectral ratio, spectral matching, those sorts of parameters, those sorts of approaches I find are much more robust than, than basing it on instantaneous frequency. Um, so the next question, um, do you think the use of ocean bottom seismometers um, will help constrain establishing links among seismic and geotechnical data and where do you see the challenges? Um, uh, yes, absolutely. I think if you can get um, seafloor instruments down to be able to get measurements so that you can, you can, direct, you can get at, um, you can, you can, Get easier get at shear wave measurements. You can actually directly look at shear waves. You can also then start to look at things like um, refracted arrivals. Um, they have a huge potential. I think the biggest issue with seafloor instruments for sorts of site survey, a lot of site survey work, is simply the scale of the sites and the density, its practicalities really. You think wind farms are um, are hundreds of kilometers, hundreds of square kilometers. Um, and so you, the sorts of frequency of sources that you need to use to get the resolution of imagery you want, you then need your ocean bottom, you need your receivers to be closely spaced. Um, and then you get into issues with, well, how many can you put down and, and that sort of thing. But uh, I mean, there's definitely, I think there's scope to use ocean bottom instruments more. Uh, I guess it's about the practicalities of how we go about doing that is a um, um, the next question so does your probabilistic approach include specific Bayesian priors based on soil properties so I think there you're talking about um, um, so I think there you're talking about this model um, so yes we gave it uh, a priori information that was based loosely on the borehole we but on the, the core data we had like i said uh, to answer to a previous question the core data was you know several hundred meters away so we 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 applied pretty broad envelopes to that and and, and we tried different envelopes um 
we tried um, doing various different envelopes, uh, pro sorry, a priori envelopes, and, and see what the sensitivity of it was. And, and I, I think in the end, we found that the sensitivity was fairly low. Um, Lucy, uh, how do you think we can get a developer buy into this approach when they're strongly born to repeatable certifiable approaches? Um, I think the answer is your guess is as good as mine. Uh, um, I think, I think, uh, honestly, I think the only thing really is, t is time. Um, it's, I think with all of the anything new that's coming through, uh, and you can go back to back to you know the days of. of of regularly acquiring multi-channel UHRS data for site surveys. It takes time before that starts to become regularly asked for, and then it takes time before that starts hitting the certifiable, you know, it starts getting certified. Um, it, it's, uh, uh, I think the, the, you know, I have had some developers buy in. We have got, you know, a number, I've done a number, a number of projects now where this is being used, some of them big, some of them small. Um, you know, before it starts getting certified, uh, yeah, who knows? <laughs> I think it's just it, it's just got to, yeah, it's a waiting game, and hopefully it keeps proving that it's useful. And if it keeps proving it's useful, eventually, hopefully, it will start to um, it it will start being more widely used. Um, uh, how long and how much to perform the jackup study? I'm not going to tell you how much because I don't think that's a question to answer here and now. How long? Um, the several weeks to do a couple of so to do, so I was doing that now. That was an, one of the earlier projects we did, which is why I have permissions now to show it. So, but if I was doing that now, it would only be a matter of, of two or three weeks to work that data up and deliver the results. It wouldn't take very long now at all. Um, what kind of seismic data we use for the machine learning? Um, uh, all of the above. We've, I've used 2D data, both 2D as in single channel 2D, as in multi-channel data and 3D data. I've applied it to everything from whole mounted chirp data right through to small air gun data. Um, like I was saying the last slide at the end, you know, the, the, the key bit, the, you know, the bit I was talking about, uh, the, this bit here, is that, you know, the frequency really controls what resolution of structure you can see. And the machine learning is not a golden bullet that's going to be able to magically get you higher frequencies to get you the higher fidelity imaging. You're always constrained by the data that you give it at the top end. Um, so you have to bear in mind, um, I think kind of coming back to Lucy's question that, that, that kind of links in there nicely is that where we will, my feeling is that where we will, where, where developers will really start to see this sort of technologies bearing fruit is if we can start getting people to think about it before the, the surveys are spec'd. Because if you can think about it before the surveys are spec'd, so that you then can think about, well, what is it we're trying to get at from the geophysical data? You can then make sure the geophysical data is appropriate for that. And a lot of what I've been doing with these sorts of data um, up till now has basically been using kind of data of opportunity and trying to squeeze the best out of it, which isn't the opt optimal way of doing it. Um, what sort of volumes of data do you need to be reliably trying the machine learning algorithm? Um, the, uh, how long is a piece of string? I think, unfortunately, is the answer to that. It depends on how complicated the subsurface is. Is the is the is the I'm afraid is the honest answer to that. If you have a very complicated subsurface, then you will obviously need more. Um, less complicated subsurfaces need less. So again, it's one of those things that it, it's a project by project basis. Um, and in terms of certification achieved for the example project, um, I th presume you mean sign off by the um, client. Um, so we did basically blind trials with the um, with their extant data and demonstrated that it was working the, to a level that they were happy with. That was how we we basically um, demonstrated it was working appropriately. Um, 
next question. Um, when you perform the inversion derived to take the parameters, how do you deal with the seabed multiple if present? Um, uh, again, that depends on the data. The ideal is, solution is you suppress it in processing, um, but that doesn't always work well. Um, so you can cast it as part of the inversion. Again, it, it depends. I deal with it on again. It's a case by case basis. I think is the take home on that. So sometimes you don't include it in the inversion because you've been able to suppress it, and other times you have to explicitly include uh, the ability to do, for multiples to be generated in your forward modeling of your in your inversion. Um, Giuseppe. Um, uh, are there issues related to the lack of low frequencies instead? Um, yes, as you well know, because you showed it in your PhD, my friend. Um, the, so yes, there are definitely issues with the lack of low frequencies. So, and the, how strong those issues are depends on, on how you're casting the inversion. Um, um, the, it, and that's where having, as I think, using, I think I, I take home, I would say on all, kind of all of that is you, you need to use all the data that you have. So um, just because, so a bit like the example I showed for the, the maintenance um, example here, this example, you know, one of the things, the key, one of the key early elements of that project that gets that very often is easy to get overlooked is the fact that we built a low frequency is that we were able to build a time to depth relationship. So we were essentially able to build a low frequency model from that. Um, and it, but it was, a, you know, it seems like something relatively simple, but it's quite a big step um, early on that is important in making sure you get good results from the more complicated, shiny stuff that you do later on. Um, uh, how long does it take to derive such uh, quantitative ground models? Again, um, unfortunately, it's uh, the honest answer is again is how long is a piece of string. It really does depend on the project and the kind of questions that are being answered. I mean, so like I said, relatively simple projects like the example I showed here. You know, if we do those now when you're looking at small areas, you don't have a lot of data. There's not necessarily a lot of reprocessing to do. And you're looking at deriving synthetic information from point locations. They can be done relatively quickly. If you're looking to try and do a whole cable route or you're looking to try and do uh, you know, hundreds of square kilometers for a wind farm site, then obviously that's a whole different ball game. Um, so it's, yeah, that's, I can't put a number on that, I'm afraid. Um, uh, what's the attribute used for the 3.3 case study one? That's the gas one. Um, so that so that was we used a number of different attributes that captured the energy and captured the discontinuities and, and those sorts of and the frequency changes in the subsurface to to build that gas saturation attribute. Um, that's how we we built that kind of um, that um, uh, free gas potential attribute. Um, uh, so the next one, um, are there game changes? So Sheila, um, are there game changing technologies on the way to fiber optic sensors and or cheap high density OBS OBC and also non seismic data such as CFEM? Yes there are some really interesting and useful technologies out there. You know, fiber optic sensors um, are one of the potential, so the question earlier about ocean bottom seismometers, um, you know, fiber optic sensors uh, and those sorts of distributed ar array type technologies are a potentially one of the, probably the best solution to that problem of how do you put them out over such large areas with the spatial sampling that you need. Um, my understanding, certainly for the fiber optic stuff, is the technology is not quite ready yet, but I know there's various groups that are working on it. So uh, yeah, I think certainly that's a very good point, Sheila, and that's a, you know, watch that space, definitely. 
in terms of EM, I know there are some groups doing some really good resistivity work, um, such as MAPM, uh, based out of France. Uh, and um, again, yeah, yes, there, there are definitely significant potential of those sorts of techniques for the shallow, for the very shallow, the top few meters to um, kind of 10 or 20 meters or so. Um, the um, again, I think they probably are very similar to the, going cause back to Lucy's question about getting developer buy-in and certification and that sort of thing. I think that you know some of the EM techniques that there are out there show great potential. It's again, it's, I think it's it's going to be a time game before eventually we start to see them being used more and more, and then I think it will really grow. Uh, and if you could feed that sort of information into the quantitative ground model as well, you know, you could, it really could start to take off. Oh, we're getting there, we're getting there. Um, just seismic inversion require too much time and computational resources. Um, uh, it depends on the project, is the honest answer to that. Um, there are some projects then when very definitely there's no the, there isn't the benefit there isn't the cost benefit to doing full reversion and trying to get geotechnical properties but that was kind of part of the message i was trying to get across at the early stages when saying that there's you know there's a lot we can leverage just from communicating our interpretation better and leveraging what we already get in terms of properties from processing so you don't have to go all whole hog with inversion to get the results for every project um, you can do quite a lot with with better communication of interpretation and with um, um, uh, um, and with and with the processing kind of um, properties. There's a you know I think there's a lot you can do with those. Hide um, how wide a range of single channel SPP types have you used with machine learning approach, and can you say anything about the relative resulting performance? I've used everything from hull mounted pinger to single channel boomer and some single channel sparker actually as well. Um, and chirp and everything in between. And I've actually used single channel air gun, so no single channel sleeve gun with it. Um, the In terms of performance, yes, you get more. You, so obviously the results that you get from single channel data are uh, less robust than if you've got a fully pre-stack image multi-channel 3D data set because you have more noise contamination in the seismic data that you're giving it. Um, again, it depends on the site, it depends on the conditions the data was acquired in, uh, etc. As, uh, as to how well it's performed or not. Um, I think that's probably the best answer to that one. Um, James Go, thanks for the uh, Are Q factors typical outputs of seismic surveys? Um, uh, so, I so Q to, so quantifying attenuation and quantify and compensating for that are I would say a standard process for exploration scale seismic processing. It's a standard step in the workflow. For site surveys, it isn't. I honestly think it ought to be. And it's standard for what we do at SAND, but I think we're a bit of an anomaly on that. It's something I really do think we need, we should be doing more of um, because it gets you straight in as a, you know, A, it's a parameter, it's, it's treating the physics of attenuation and getting your better kind of your um, getting your imagery, uh, your better imagery, um, but also it gets you a handle on the soil, uh, on the, the grain scale properties as well. So it's it's useful from a variety of different ways. Um, seismic inversion rocks that you get from this process and all these computation intensive. Um, uh, yes, they can be computation intensive. If you the, the more so there's a scale, I guess seismic inversion is an umbrella term for a whole variety of different tools, which can range from straight, you know, kind of reflectivity style inversions, just getting impedance right up to things like the full waveform inversion that Giuseppe used or that people like Mike Warner at Imperial apply to exploration scale data. 
that can get you a full kind of elastic characterization of the subsurface. So it can get you P and S to A velocity, bulk density, P and Q uh, attenuation estimates. Um, obviously, if you're doing the full waveform in an elastic sense, that's incredibly computationally extensive, expensive. Um, so again, you have to see it as a suite of tools and you look for the most appropriate ones for the specific project and the data that you have and the questions that you're answering. Um, in what format is the data input into the machine learning algorithm? Is the pure data from the survey or has it been interpreted before use? It depends. Yeah, so, well, so I work in, so the, the format is, so these are, these are in-house software algorithms that we have developed they work with Segui data because it's the best, it, it's the standard way of storing geophysical data. Um, and it depends, in terms of the pure data, it depends upon what you're doing. If you're doing full waveform inversion, then you tend to give it more the, the, the raw data because you're basically putting all of the physics into the inversion process. If you're doing something like reflectivity inversion, then you do, you certainly do some processing before that and you probably want to do a level of interpretation before it as well so you can get a handle on what is a sensible result or not. Although you might not tend to put the interpretation into, actually directly into the results. Um, I guess I personally, I would tend to caution doing that. I would tend to uh, suggest you probably want to do the, have some level of interpretation to help quality control and make sure the results will look good but I would, my personal approach is to hold that back, kind of run the inversion separate from that and then put the two together afterwards so that you're not biasing your inversion at all. Do you use seismic velocity information in your predictions? For some of them, yes. For others, no. Um, how do you obtain accurate key factor values from such data? Um, uh, we have a bunch of algorithms that, that use fairly standard processes um, and um, we, we tend, to, we, you know, we put quite a lot of work into them, but they tend to produce fairly robust key factor estimates. Um, I mean, there's a, lot, there's a raft of literature on how to, on various different methods that you can use to estimate key factor. Um, Guillaume. What is the most important assignment attribute when training your ANN for soil property prediction? Oh, yes. Um, uh, it depends on the site and it depends on the, uh, on the geology, if I'm perfectly honest. Different, um, yeah, different sites. I think, and they think this is part of the problem with trying to get to geotechnical parameters from the geophysical data is it so depend what you, the results you get are so dependent on the geology and different attributes will respond in different ways to different geology, just different geological settings. So um, in different, you know, in some geological settings, certain attributes will, will really dominate and will, will be much more sensitive to change to the observed geotechnical changes. In other settings, it will be other um, attributes. So again, I don't think it's one I can put a specific attribute on. And finally, um, when determining your technical problem use, using the techniques you discussed, do you feel there is still the need for ground truthing and confirming the results? Absolutely, 100%, no doubt, yes, absolutely. You need, I, I, um, you don't, I don't see seismic inversion and producing geotechnical parameters in this way as it's not going to um, it's not going to be a direct like for like replacement, like replacement for ground truth. And you can't just say, oh, we don't need to get ground truth data, any ground truth data at all. We'll just invert for it. You need to have some. Now, like in the case study, like the, the one on the screen, so that, that's like that, they had a bunch of extant ground investigation data that we could use. So I guess this is where the benefits come is that, is that, it's not about saying, you know, you don't need any ground investigation data. I think where the, the benefits from these sorts of approaches come are that you can potentially either make better use of extant data that you already have 
and or you can um, potentially either maybe reduce the number of ground investigation sites that you do or some of the stuff that you can do with these sorts of inversion uh, approaches which I haven't had time to talk about is you can uh, you can use them particularly if you're leveraging the earlier stuff like the interpretation and the processing results because the geophysical data comes in first you can use that to capture some of the spatial variability before you plan your ground investigation um, um, crews so you could use some of that information to make a, I guess a more informed judgment in terms of where you needed to place your ground investigation sites to better capture the spatial variability in the subsurface properties. I think that's a, a fair answer to that. Uh, thank you very much. It was a quite a comprehensive question and answer session you Best. managed to answer 25 questions that's quite impressive I, I i think it's a record <laughs> the there's one break. more that's just snuck in um uh the i'll i'll answer the what is one last question Artem. yes then, yes so please the, yes how dependent is the absolute solution on the seismic version on the boundary conditions of the problem i.e the background model um uh, again, I think that depends on the method that you're applying. Some methods are more sensitive to having a good background model than others. Uh, so or impedance inversion, for instance, if you're going through that route, because impedance inversion doesn't get the low frequency background model at all, the absolute values you get from that are completely reliant on having a good background model. The relative changes, however, are still useful and particularly if you're using that so like i was just talking about is using that to help maybe inform spatial variability so that you could better plan locations for your cpts and boreholes actually just having the relative variability itself is is in some cases as useful an information as having the absolute um uh, value for other parameters such as if you go as far as for wave form inversion those sorts of tools the um then they're less uh, they, then because that is is making a, a more comprehensive modeling of the seismic wave field it can also help build its own long wavelength background model so there are ways to kind of do that as part of the inversion um so um and i think one of the way yeah i think and i think that's so that uncertainty you get on the absolute values is um I think that uncertainty is something not to be underestimated and I, I think personally that's one of the reasons why all of the inversion kind of approaches that we use are stochastic based ones so we're looking for parameter envelopes rather than single values because I think if you start looking for a single value and saying that is the right value essentially you're always going to be wrong because you will never get that absolutely perfect correct value whereas if you cast it as a stochastic sensor and you get a, a parameter envelope um, you get uh, your you're trying to essentially you're trying to capture the variability in the solution and the uncertainty in the solution which I think is a much more tractable problem uh, right done yeah and that's make it the final of the yeah. session thank you. <laughs> thank you very much for your patience and for very detailed answers